Welcome to the Mike on Much podcast. I'm your host, Mike Veerman, and I'm here with my friend and trusty producer, Max Kerman. We are also here with our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. And joining us today, I think this might be his third time on our podcast, maybe even fourth, is our great friend and former co-worker, Matt Unsworth, all the way from L.A. Matt, what's going on? Great to see you guys. Great to have you. And We'd congrats on your show, dudes. That's amazing. Oh, thank thanks, you, thank man. You. Yeah, it's, it's out now on Crave. Uh, if you are listening to this and you haven't subscribed yet, maybe... Uh, Subscribe. I think the first month is free. Oh, what's this? What is this? Webby D literally is pulling out alcohol right now. For who? What is it? Who's it from? Who's oh it my from? goodness. This is unexpected. We just started recording and he's handed us two bottles of liquor. Maybe got there. And a oh uh, card goodness. that says the pod. Who's it's it from? Champagne. Maybe is this just this for Unzi because he's in town? Oh, that's so nice. This is from them. manager Ash. Oh. oh, what? See, this is what makes her so good. She does everything for me, and I didn't get her anything. Oh, and my she's buying. And she, and she's buying drink us it now. a drink. Yeah, let's drink it now. We, 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 oh, and then this is a card from Webby D. Can I read this on air? I you guys read. do all the work. Uh, should I read this on air or should we save it for off? Uh, <laughs> let's save her off. Let's okay, so, yeah. so, so, so as I was saying before, Webby D, who is very sweet and manager ass, provided all this liquor and this can, card. Can, can you, one of you guys crack it, actually, so we can drink it? <laughs> we also, in the studio, sitting here, but it's Thank not on mic, is Jonathan Popolis, who does the Pedestal yeah. podcast with Shane and I, which I hope you guys have also oh. checked it out. We're promoting so much shit. I mean, yeah. we got to really streamline. Thank you. Uh, so you guys this are is so nice. sweet. And Manager Ash, uh, thank you so much. It, Manager Ash does like so much work for this podcast. Honestly, for real. Huge shout out to her because she she loves a, this podcast and cares about this podcast so much and has helped us through all the negotiations. You know, as we sorted out the television show, and she's got great taste and is just a kind of a guiding presence for me all the time. And you guys get a bit of that too with the pod. 100%. So uh, so huge thank you to Manager yeah. Ash. But but speaking of Manager Ash. You know, Unzi is a beloved guy. Like, when you bring up Unzi in our group of friends, people just smile and think, oh, and just immediately they say, Unzi's the best. He's revered. He's Thanks, revered. Guys. You it's, are No, revered. you really are. Yeah, you, Thanks, you, guys. Like, even guy, though you, you live in, uh, in Los Angeles, you, you know, you did live here, and you've been on Champagne Boys bachelor parties. You're yeah. in the Champagne Boys message group. It's, and it's a big Honored. deal uh, for, for Unzi to show up to a bachelor party, cause, and it's always kind of fun, and it's a bit of a surprise for a lot of people, because we all travel, we will be on the plane together, and then usually, like, the next day... <laughs> <laughs> Unzi will emerge <laughs> and flying in from California our blue eyes. He just appears blonde, in the Bahamas yeah. or he appears in Miami. It's the best. But I'll say this. I don't think anybody's a big a fan of Unzi uh, as at Manager Ashes. That's because, funny. Because she was she she was talking about is Unzi gonna be on the pod? Is that, like she knows oh. the, the schedules and the rhythms and she knows that you'd be in town. She's like, I love it. and she fucking loves you. I so. was just gonna say the same about her oh, and good. how awesome she is. She sent in a bunch of stuff for my podcast. Uh, I think she was probably helped out you and her helped out get me to Coachella that one weekend. That's right, yeah. Uh, um, just, yeah, the best. Yeah, she, yeah. so anyway, she's, she's going to be very excited that you're on the show. This is really nice because we're recording this like right before Christmas. It's I mean, Friday, yeah. 5.30 on a Friday before Christmas. That's right. Yeah. Un Unzi is in town uh, because he's here for the holidays, visiting home. And it's kind of like this loose feeling around the building right now. And we're all going to go out for drinks after this because we our show premiered today. I mean, you might not be hearing this podcast for a week or two because Shane's leaving for vacation. So we're trying to bank a few, but just know that when you're listening to this, we're all in a very festive uh, feeling. Yeah, we're all on cloud nine, uh, and we're all going out for drinks after. Webby D is going to join us. John, Johnny P is going to join us, and uh, yeah, we yeah. This is a really a time where you feel grateful for what you got. And today's been a really fun day with the show coming out and seeing people watch it and react to it. So, yeah, thank you guys yeah. all for uh, for watching. We've been watching all your videos as you post. You guys watching it in your homes or on your computers or whatever. And uh, it's been a real thrill for us. Yeah. So, um, but I've been very excited to talk to you, Anzi, because we keep in touch. But um, I haven't talked to you much since you started working uh, uh, on the TV show. Yeah. Because I've always been fascinated by your job. Because you do a similar thing to Shane and Mike, but down in L.A. You previously had. But you were always go going down with sort of the intention of r writing, being a comedy writer or just a writer in general. So can you talk about how you, what, what made you leave your job at Amazon and how you ended up working on the show? When I left Amazon? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was, it just got to the time where I went out to LA with the intention of writing. And I didn't stop, like it's really hard to get in to the writer's room, and way harder than I thought it was going to be. And so I hadn't, st I've been writing on the side for, I got there six years ago. So just writing uh, movies and, and TV shows and sending them out and getting notes and uh, really going for it and, and meeting people meeting people and that was a, that's a big thing about there is, is meeting people and you know 
the first thing is just meeting great friends and then maybe the byproduct would be you might work on a show of theirs or whatever but never like going out just to smooth like just to like meet people and like be buddies with them mm -hmm. and i've gotten like a really good great crew out there one of them tim mcauliffe which is who was on the pod that's right one of the first couple episodes yep. and uh he's a great friend out there he's also a much a former much a former expat much yeah expat mm -hmm. and I eventually, I got to working at Am I, every every couple of years at Amazon, you get like a stock vest and you get like some, some of the stock and those are like... And they give you a vest also. <laughs> and they give you, it's a, it's a vest made of their stock. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you kind of like work towards like the two year or the four year mark or whatever. And so my two years, I was like, I'm without a job lined up or anything, I'm just going to go for it and I'm going to quit quit the day of my two years mm, which and is bold because it's great gigs are hard to find yeah for sure and it was like a really i mean it was a a really hard job to get and it was uh it was like yeah it was a it was a pretty good job to what, be. Was, your, what was your job at amazon so i was a uh, eventually became like a one of the creative directors at amazon same thing as these guys do here uh but just doing it for amazon tv shows but you're the creative director so you that was there, like a level higher it's a little different there there's like f there's like seven creative directors right and, and i remember being fascinated by that job because last time i was in la and we hung out and i did a heist podcast you're telling me about a super a super bowl spot that you had to manage and oversee for the new john krasinski show jack ryan yeah. and and the super bowl spot is worth millions of dollars as we all know and like you know, you were on copy with Jeff Bezos. I don't know if you can talk. You, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but just basically, it's like you were dealing with people very, very high up, like the director of the show. Was it Michael Mann or? It's uh, uh, the. Uh, oh, sorry, you're thinking of Michael Bay. Michael Bay. Sorry. Michael Bay is part of it. And if you have, if you s spend a certain amount of money at Amazon to doing anything, there's a point where Bezos has to approve it. So okay. he actually had to watch the Super Bowl spot and say yes or no. And you were the guy directing and making sure it Just, all got done. Yeah, with a, bunch of other people. with a bunch of other people. It was a high-pressure job. It was the highest pressure job I've ever had in my entire life. Yeah. Like, so I, I can't believe I, like, honestly, I think I lost 10 years of my life. Wow. Lifespan Man. working there for two years. It was and, insane. And so I thought that job in itself was really interesting, but you, we knew that you were making friends and wanted to be in the writer's room. But, and you were also writing a blog on the side. Uh, yeah. Clown, hilarious blog. Clown, yeah. Salad, clown Salad. Which I recommend everybody check Every out. Every time he comes on, we promote his Clown Salad. <laughs> Do you still do that? I put on a hiatus when I was work while I was at on the show because it takes it took out quite a long time. Yeah. So then you you quit after two years and and then what was the period of time between quitting and getting in the writers room for Happy Together? So uh, I quit in February, and then I started the job in the end of May. Okay. So what I did was I got a WeWork office in Hollywood, and I would just go there every day and made it. I can't work at home or anything like that. And just kind of tra traded my writing as like I was going into the office and writing nine, nine hours a day, but for various things like mm -hmm. uh, for the clown salad or for um, when that show was beat, the, the show happened together, the show that I'm on, when that show was going through the processes of it, I was also, Tim would send a script and I would send in punch up jokes. Uh. So he highlights, say 20 jokes in the 20 minute screenplay, uh, screenplay for the episode. And then I would send back, say, 12 different jokes for each of those ones he highlighted. And, and Tim McAuliffe, for, for our context, it was the showrunner and creator of this show. And so he obviously has a lot of cachet in that whole operation. Yeah, for sure. There's two showrunners. And the funny thing is, your live episode with Reggie Watts, is that yeah. who it was? Yeah, yeah. Remember he mentions that guy Ben Winston who eats the mushroom chocolates? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he says that guy who runs a corn show. He, also, he was also a producer on our show. And it's actually based on Ben Winston's... I don't know if you know in the backstory, basically the show is based on Ben Winston. He was like a producer on Britain's Got Talent or something hmm. when Harry Styles was coming up before One Direction. Oh. And Harry Styles was like, he wanted to move out of his parents' house. And Ben Winston was like, this guy working the show was like, you can live in my attic if you want and hang out. And Harry Styles then lived there for another four years while One Direction got massive. And he'd like uh. go play a stadium, then go stay at Ben Winston's house in the attic wow and that's what the show is based on yeah and it's funny that he mentioned ben winston in your yeah, yeah. live show thanks for listening to the reggie watts episode yeah oh, thank yeah. you good. <laughs> so um and then what so would describe what happens when tim reaches out and say i want to hire you because you're kind of working informally for him it sounds like yeah so he's done a few other projects that i would help punch up and be on set for other pilots that didn't go he called me and said there's a few process I, uh so he called me and says it looks like it's good looks like you're going to be hired and we have to sell you to CBS. So 
uh, he got me to put together like things that I had done, which really opened my eyes to like things that you thought would never be used. Like clown salad, for instance, like I use that as one of my references and other things that I put together as a package to send to CBS so they could approve me to work there. Without clown salad, do you think you would have gotten the job? Probably. It was just more of like a group of a yeah. whole, like all the kind of things I've ever done in one little package that I sent to them. And but, but you're probably thinking in that moment, oh, I'm glad I kept busy with the extracurriculars. Right. Because if I didn't have this body of work, then Tim wouldn't have as much to stand behind. Right, for yeah. sure. And it's like one thing maybe on its own isn't that important, but a group of things mm-hmm. like doing a video that goes viral or something else like that. And you had like two huge videos that went viral, probably even more. I only really had like, I had one pretty big one. Uh, oh, the, the robot other one was sluts of Instagram, or sorry, yeah. sluts off. Right? Yeah, I didn't yes. send that one to CBS. Yes. <laughs> I found it. Though. Sluts of Starstream. Yeah, that what it was. Uh, sluts, sluts off Instagram. Oh, right. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is very funny. Um, Look it up. <laughs> but basically, uh, so the real process went after that. Tim calls me up and he says, "You got the job. They're going to send you the contract over." Wow. And so I've been waiting for this day my entire life. So I, I've instantly well, yeah. What was that night like? Freaked out. I was waiting for an official call. And we were out, it was like a Friday, and I was just like so anxious. But you never know, something's gonna fall apart and whatever. But I think most people say, oh, well, like I would be like, I don't believe until I actually That's, like, see the official thing. I was like, I don't believe until I'm standing on set. Yeah. Um, but they eventually sent in the contract, and I don't have an agent or a manager or anything. So I don't even know if this is a good deal or a bad deal <laughs> or like hey, manager you know, Ash, what it means. Just get her on it, she'll Man, figure I it out. I should have talked to manager yeah. Ash. <laughs> Uh, should have shown. Did it seem good to you though? Were you like? It oh, seemed great. I was like, I do it for free. Like, I just want to be in the writers. Yeah, I'll room. pay you. Yeah, like, exactly. Let me in. Yeah. Uh, it was like that looks good to me, and it was like a three-year contract. They paper teamed me with another guy, so me and another guy kind of act as one writer together, mm-hmm. as far as like payroll goes and stuff. The guy I didn't know. I know him now. He's a good buddy, but I didn't know who he was then. So I had some concerns. Sure. But I didn't care. I was just like, let's party. This is the greatest news I've ever gotten. Yeah. Oh, man. And so, uh, and then walk us through, maybe start with, we have some familiarity, but what is a writer's room? What's a day day in the life of a a writer in a a comedy writer's room? So to what Max is saying is it's like, I think when you got this gig, you know, being in sort of like this legit network television show writer's room, it's like this thing that like, I think for guys like us, like uh, yourself and Shane and and myself, when we were like working here, we'd always talk about like, that's kind of the dream in a weird way that you could get paid to like write jokes and sort of like build these stories in the way that we would picture a writer's room. So when you got the gig, we were like up here, like so excited. Like it was the craziest. it really was, was a awesome. moment where I was like, you did it! Yeah, it's like <laughs> talking to all you guys that day about it. Yeah, it was insane. It was I guess for us to be excited, what was it like for you to, like, one, find out? Do you think, is it terrifying because you're like, fuck, I don't want to blow it? Or are you like, this is the opportunity I needed. I'm just running with this now. It was both of those things, like, to the T. I was so scared that I was going to blow it somehow. And uh, also so excited to do it. And so I just... Went full bore and like made sure I showed up an hour before anyone else did. Like I walked the first day, I walked in the office, and there was no one there, and the lights were off. I was <laughs> sitting on a couch like a psycho, and staying past anyone leaves and just anything they do, just write and just like just do twice as much as you think they're expecting or whatever. I really just, you're that guy in the gym putting up an extra 500 just shots. Trying, you know, first guy in, last guy out. And there's like, so the way the writers' room worked on our show is. They kind of split. There's a lot of writers, but they split us off. Each screenplay, each script will have, say we're working on like episode four in one day. They'll break the room into two pieces. One is story and overall of the episode. And one is just the punch up room where all you're doing is just making jokes funnier. Oh, wow. What's the better team to be on? So it's usually team A is the story overall episode. They're worrying about like seasonal arcs and all this other stuff and network. And those are the more the senior people. And then the punch up is the like more junior people but it's usually run the room is run by a, a senior person kind of overseas is them. tim jumping back and forth tim and uh austin the other showrunner they're actually either on set going over editing they aren't actually i don't think they were very almost never in the room uh-huh. they were uh, reading what we'd done the day before and making notes for what we were doing the day that day wow. and yeah it was sitting in a room with like 
eight people that are everyone was so amazing it was the best job I've ever had in my entire life was and, everyone really funny in real life or was it like a special type of writer funny where it didn't no, necessarily translate I have always heard like these stories these like grumpy kind of bitter comedy writers or like they're massive nerds or something but everyone was super funny and super supportive and they would be like like a lot of them were stand-ups or they would go do U- UB- yeah, UCB shows after work or they were in Groundlings. Like they're all really active in the comedy world. I think you have to do that to mm-hmm. kind of have a career. But everyone was great and we would just sit, like say, in, I was in the punch room almost exclusively and we would just sit in a room. We had snacks and food and all that stuff covered and we'd just <laughs> sit in a room just like this and just crack jokes back and forth. Oh, that, yeah. They went, all day. And... Uh, when Tim McAuliffe talked about like his day, like when we first hung out three or four years ago and we're sitting in like Tim's like beautiful home in Silver Lake <laughs> in his hot tub, in his like hot tub with his like beautiful <laughs> wife, not to talk about his wife all the time. She but, was in the tub too. Oh yeah. Wow. I actually know she wasn't, but, um, and, and then it's just like knowing that like you go into like, yeah, that's your, that's your day. Yeah. And then while you, you're doing that during the day and at night, you're probably thinking of your next project and you're scheming for the next thing. I was like, he's like, that does truly sound like a dream job. Like it really like it lives is. up to the billing and even more. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I've never had a job where I was like, I could do this for the rest of my life and be completely satisfied. Um, what was, what was so um, the, uh, did, did you feel like overwhelmed at all like on the first few days just just out of nerves or yeah yeah. i think uh probably all of us kind of struggle with this sort of when you're in that situation when you don't want to talk too much but you want to talk enough Mm -hmm. and trying to find that balance so you're not the only guy talking in the room but you're not the guy that no one talked in the room Mm -hmm. and learning where your place is and kind of the hierarchy of situations like that that was always scary. Like sometimes I would go home and be like, oh my God, I said so many stupid things today and, and stuff like that. Was there ever like a, was it, did you feel safe to bomb? Yeah. Cause usually the first couple jokes, people will just suicide bomb. Like they'll just throw out a stupid joke just and to it get just, it going. just to get it going and you relax. And there's a lot, they don't know when we write, say we write, we do a punch up. They just send that script to the other room, and so each joke, say, has 40 alt jokes to it. They don't know who wrote any of those things. Um, and so it's just like, it's not that much pressure. Obviously, you want them to pick your joke, yep. but... Only the people in the room would know whose joke it was. Only the people in the room know whose joke it was. Only the people in the room know who bombed. Everyone bombs at least twice a day. So getting comfortable with that, but once... And I think that took also just knowing those people and be comfortable bombing in front of them. Did you become super close with any of the writers? Like you're like, that guy's my style or he's my mentality or I just like having a drink with that one. It was, uh, honestly, across the board, we all, it was funny. It was like, felt like a little bit of camp. Like we all had created like all these wacky inside jokes and gags <laughs> and we all like went to Vegas together on a retreat. What? And like Whoa. partied and it was super fun. Like and that wrote an episode. They in, like, paid, a work paid for it? Yeah. Oh, uh, we're in the wrong and, business. Uh, and we all hung out. It was great. You guys ever get courtside seats to basketball games? Yeah. <laughs> no, we did not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Has Max ever tried to uh, show up at your work? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. So what's next? What's the, the next thing? How does it work? I just, so uh, I just want to keep doing it. Yeah. So it's really a whole thing now where, you know, a show shoots and then it goes and you're kind of wrapped for a couple of months and then you're looking for if you're going to go on another show or what, you know, how your show you're on, how it's doing. Yeah. And what I've been told is you go to like multiple interviews around April for different shows and try and get on one of those staff and hopefully staffed in one of those shows. Hopefully someone from, that I've met during this show can say, yeah, that guy's funny or whatever, what his strengths are. Mm -hmm. And so get in there. But yeah, I think the next step is really just like keep doing it. And there's a really great kind of ladder with a union painted right away where it's like you start as a, a staff writer, you make this, your next season, you go to a, uh, story editor, you make this amount, and then it's just it's laid out for you. It's uh, super the whole unionized thing. and figured out with yeah. the, the Writers Guild. But you're yeah. in the WGA now. Yeah, this got me in the WGA, which yeah, is great. You're you're just completely uh, blowing over the fact that in the elevator you're bragging to me and Shane that you just get screeners for movies. He's got an Aquaman on his phone because he's really? in the WGA. It's, he's got he's the screeners got screeners the best part. He's got uh, what's <laughs> that? Uh, he's got Born uh, Stars Born just sitting on his phone. Yeah, yeah, it's the best. I guess the other thing too is. 
I don't actually have a manager or an agent, so I'm looking to get in a manager in the next like uh, month. Is that, is that why usual? manager Ash sent the vote yeah. while Unzi was here? She trying to seduce me? Yeah. She want to rep me? Oh, Ash, smart. do you want to rep me? Uh, it should yeah. probably be the best uh, thing that ever happened. Yeah. Yeah. Is that unusual to, to get the gig without a ma- manager? I think so, yeah. No, one, I was the only person on the staff who didn't at least have a manager. Uh-huh. And um, it's also what I found super surprising is I thought it wouldn't be really hard to get, say, an agent when I'm on a show on CBS that's currently on TV. And not the case. Oh, oh interesting. Really? So yeah. you're, you're out there saying, I need an agent. And people are like, eh. I've put out some feelers for like uh, just a few agencies. And it's like, I can't do anything for that guy. And you're like, wow, this is cool. not what I expected. Weird. Mm. It's really like, you don't get seeing everyone else in the room, too, that are like leaps and bounds above me. You don't get to a point where this, the stuff starts rolling in. Always. They're always fighting for the next job. They're always writing a pilot while they're working on the show. Mm. It's just a constant, like, you always have to just keep it. Keep, it's like a shark. A shark has to always be moving or else yeah, it yeah. dies. Yeah, yeah, if you stop. So one thing that, that I find super interesting is, like, when you left the Amazon job at the end of the two years, right? Yeah. Um, you don't know that you have anything lined up. No. You just take a leap of faith. Even, like, it seems like the nature of writing, you don't know if a show gets picked up from season to season. Are you someone that feels comfortable living in, like, the, I don't know where the next paycheck's going to Because I, I would have difficulty doing that. Like, just, just oh, for my for own sure. peace of mind. Yeah, I, I definitely don't feel comfortable with it. It's super scary. As lo- I think is if you if you make a plan and you you like you really kind of hit the bricks and like you have certain money money aside you're a plan to be unemployed at the worst say six months and you know what you're gonna do every day and if you just work your balls off in that mode I think that you'll you're always gonna be okay mm-hmm. I guess or boobs a lot of female writers mm-hmm. yeah sorry yeah boobs or balls so do you um, have a lot uh, squirreled away. You don't have to say how much, but you can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's never, no, it's, I mean, it, that's the thing. It's like, you know that you're going to be penny pitching and stuff. It's just like enough to be like, okay, my rent and like some stuff is covered for, I have enough for, to live for five months. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it is, it is definitely scary, but it's super fun as well. Cause you're living like, on the edge. You're living on the edge. Yep. You're going into WeWork and you're just doing whatever you feel like <laughs> yeah. doing every day, which is a blast. I'm sure it'd be different if I had kids, if I had a mortgage, like I luckily at these at, right now, I don't have those things. So I'm a little bit more free to kind of take those chances. But still, I think if anyone takes that chance, as long as you really work hard and really focus on what you want to get out of it, I think it's totally worth it. Yeah. It's hard with kids. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get to Margaret Cho? I mean, Max, you kind of really went in an interview direction with Unzi. Like, I feel like this has been an examination. I thought we were just going to be four pals shooting the shit. Yeah, I, I've been fascinated. I was just going to ask this at the bar in like an hour anyway. So yeah. I thought was, this was set up where it was like, oh, Max wants to take this over because you were just chilling. Well, once Max started going in that direction, I, I know. I've been wondering well, about these questions. none of us have really yeah. talked in a long time. So, I, I mean, these are like, you know. I've been curious I, to, to, to ask these questions for the last like three, four months. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think it was great that yeah. you did. I, was, I just went with the flow. Yeah. Once Max started, we're gonna have to get a sketch of Unzi now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the feature interview. Margaret yeah. Show out. We don't need Margaret Show. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yes, uh, like Max mentioned, uh, we do have Margaret Show as our feature interview today. We did this uh, during Just for Laughs in Toronto. Uh, it was a great conversation, sort of about um, her talking about her appeal to like sort of like her crowd, her making her way in comedy in during the time that she did in the '90s, seeing a niche that she could fill, and also sort of like cultivating her crowd and the people that would come out for her and who she realized she spoke to. She also got kind of candid about Louis C.K., which I thought. Was interesting because it's someone who is obviously uh, she's a peer of Louis and part of that whole old school gang that has been doing it for a very long time. Uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, we're going to get to her in a second, but before that, if you are listening just for the first time, maybe you're a Margaret Cho fan. We have over a hundred episodes, 120 episodes of the Michael Much Podcast. Interviews with musicians, actors, directors, and an astronaut, all sorts, and we now have. Eight episodes of a TV show on Crave. So if you're in Canada, and hopefully soon outside of Canada, you can subscribe to Crave. First month's free, I believe, and watch our eight episodes. Sting, Shaggy, Noel Gallagher, uh, shit, Leon Bridges. Lights. 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 Alessia Cara, Jared Kiso, Jody Whitaker, who is Doctor Who. Check it out. Shane does all sorts of hilarious digital desserts with the cast of Jersey Shore. Hayden Christensen. Darth Vader, baby. But. <laughs> but uh, as well as a Jacob Trombley impersonator and our very own beloved R. Kels. And Chris Red. 
And Chris Red from Saturday Night Live, who actually I think just retweeted us or something. He did. Mm-hmm. Webby D just told us that. Uh, Unzi, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And just to t- uh, tease the dessert a yeah. little bit, if you're an aspiring writer, uh, we do have a call-in show coming up that I think is going to go very well, where people are going to call in and ask Matt some questions. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm super excited to answer those. Yeah, call in. I'd love to answer anyone who has uh, any questions about Hollywood. I imagine people have a ton of questions for a big Hollywood writer. I yeah, bet. for yeah. sure. Um, do you have any thoughts on Margaret Cho before we throw it to her, uh, Unzi? Big fan. Yeah. So we're going to get to her. Are you going to listen to this interview? Of course I will. All right. How's it going? We're just going to roll on this. Cool. Good. Oh, you're wearing a Rush shirt, which is pretty good. I'm representing Canada. You know, um, I love Rush. I had the <laughs> picture disc to Subdivisions in 1982. Was it maybe 1983? Um, something like that. And uh, I've been a huge fan of theirs forever. And I think um, when you come to Canada, you have to, you know, give props yeah. to Rush or Tegan and Sarah or the other, yeah. at the very least, Nico Case. <laughs> or maybe uh, I'd like to give it up to um, Bare Naked Ladies. Oh, yes. I was just speaking to Stephen Page. He was just oh on the show uh, last week. Yeah, he's great. One week ago, he was on these exact mics. It's been one week <laughs> since he's been on the show. <laughs> Literally, I saw one time Brian Boitano do a routine to that song. Went and it was the most crazy. Yeah. Um, it was a, like it wasn't part of the Olympics or anything. It was kind of like a I think it was a one off. I'm not sure if it was another competition, but he uh, sort of dressed as maybe it was sort of a a bare naked ladies themed okay. dance ice dance. <laughs> um, but to that song, which I you, you didn't think about it as a being a kind of an ice dancing song. No, it's too. It's like frantic. It, it's and there's a lot of words. Yeah. Um, uh, th- something about vanilla being the flavor. I don't. I don't remember all, all of the words exactly. There's a lot of like very stern pronouncements in that song. Of course, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'm I'm an honor to be on the same show or in the in the same framework. Yes, a hundred percent. That's I, great. I was just gonna say it's a very savvy move to wear like a rush shirt uh, to, when you're walking around doing press in Canada. <laughs> you but have you're to. a legitimate fan, so I am. I'm I'm doubly impressed. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, basically when it comes to the entrepreneurial aspect of the entertainment business. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always interesting to me because creative and sort of like, uh, being driven to sort of understand the business side of it and sort of all of those things. Are you someone that sort of immediately sort of understood the dynamic? Like, are you someone that was like, I want to set out to this and this and this and this because I'm ambitious and I'm going to, I'm going to understand my own business or are you like, I'm just interested in doing creative things. And if it leads to sort of, um, I think that there are some business savvy things that I have done in my career that have proven to be kind of become industry standards, oddly. Um, Like I remember in 1999 and 2000, I did my first big special that I filmed and I brought the reels to theaters and I would carry it all over the world to um, get people watching it. And it was kind of like, I mean... Like you toured the film? I toured the film. Interesting. So I I would buy out the theater a movie theater, uh, like for one showing, and then I would sell all the tickets, and then I would tear the tickets and greet the audience, bring them into the theater, then I would do a whole question and answer thing with them, So and I would watch the movie with them. So it was a very strange thing where you're kind of like um, curating the entire event around what you're doing, and I think, I, I feel like this is sort of a very early version of the con. <laughs> like, it's like a kind of a convention. Yeah, 100%. But very small one. Or um, something kind of like where you're, um, you know, getting your your audience. But this, and this is before, you know, social media. So you had to kind of create that kind of thing within comedy. Um, and so, the, in, I mean, it was in a lot of different movements in comedy where, where mainstream comedy and alternative comedy kind of split. Yeah. And so that, that was sort of another one that was kind of before I did my special, but it was a, this, a, this kind of a, I think, 
mentality around comedy now is is much more it's sped along by entities like Netflix and all of the other places where you can get these specials out there and they find your audience for you but it's a different kind of time yeah but there's still value in you know you going in person that's because yeah. what they're getting is you ripping the ticket and you doing yeah. the Q&A after and it gets yeah. to be this real communal thing I think you comparing it to like a, a comic con or like a fan expo is yeah. like, it's this early version of that and pre-social media it's hard to organize like that that's really yeah. like flyers on the ground it was cool Free planning in cities it was really cool and it was really something that i i really enjoyed i mean it was so um different and you know the way that you would get to your fans at, at that point in comedy was a totally different thing and um comedy itself was something that i had to break into and kind of brand because I was so very different from all the other comedians like because I started in the 80s and there you know there are very few women there are definitely no Asian people it was very very um, difficult to find a place there when you felt really invisible or you didn't feel like you belonged how okay well that's interesting to me so I guess are you intimidated when you're breaking in are you feeling like this is going to be like a a large mountain to climb or are you just thinking like no fuck I, i just need to get in there and do it both you know you needed that kind of bravado and confidence to get out there and do it but at the same time it was really terrifying like i was always a scared about the green room because it was all the way the guys were all of these you know and they were all much older than me at least 20 years older than me and all men. And so I felt very like intimidated by green rooms and dressing rooms and everything. Cause that's sort of where they would congregate and kind of be there. And I was like, I don't know if I'm allowed to be in there. And it was weird to kind of feel like I couldn't belong to this club oddly. Um, but you know, that, that went away, but it, you know, of course you needed that overly like confident bravado to get you through and get you in the door and get to you do that kind of work people. get on stage yeah. you have to have a bit of that inside of you of course I, I mean and then you said you eventually found uh, that you were a part of the club and that it was welcoming and that yes. fraternity of comedians yes and that coming to um a place of having an audience like i realized that people were coming to see me because at my shows they felt safe there was uh uh, it was a hostile place in comedy clubs in the 80s and 90s for people of color, for gay people, for women. They felt like, okay, if we sit anywhere near the front, we're going to get made fun of by the comic who's going to... We'll be a target. Yeah, we'll be a target. And so they never came to clubs. And so uh, at my shows, it was where all of the gay people would come and all of the minorities would come and all of the women would come. And so then then you had a different kind of clientele. This mm-hmm. is very cool. So that in itself was a kind of understanding of like, oh, I actually can create my own uh, industry within this larger industry. Was that by design or an accident? These it, are just the people that started coming to your shows? They started coming. And it, I didn't realize, I, I part of it was um, I had a couple of television appearances that they were showing at the gay video bars. So there was gay video bars in San Francisco where people would just like sit and you know watch comedy or they watch whatever and my videos were in the rotation of what they would watch. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, we got to see her. And so then they would start coming to this comedy club because they were like, oh, well, this we have never been here. This is different. And uh, then it just started to grow. And that... Um, that, I think that's where it started, um, and uh, and so that was really exciting. I'm always uh, interested in the way that creatives sort of put together their work, only because it's unconventional compared to other sort of jobs. Like yeah. meaning, like some people need to be inspired in order to actually do the work. Other people yeah. are workhorses, and they go, "No shit, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it every day, even if it's not good." And then eventually, yeah. I'll put together. Where do you fall on that spectrum? I think it's it's both. You know, like I kind of go at it a lot a lot of ways. So the, you know, there's certainly these dumb jokes that I've been telling. For for over 30 years <laughs> that have no never ever gotten a laugh but yet I still I'm like there's something there I'm still gonna do it I'm sticking to it I don't I know that one day <laughs> I will be right about this and then um, there's other things like you go oh well I don't know I don't I don't know why this is good but it's good and then you know and then sometimes you don't know so it's it's weird like I think that we all have uh, an equal amount of turns being an idiot and being a genius <laughs> That's what comedy is, is kind of a genius idiocy. Do you feel, I mean, are you someone that workshops incessantly before you, say, maybe tape a special or um, make it permanent? As I don't it know. Will? I mean, I do and I, I, I do and I don't. Like, I've done, I've done it where I've really, really prepared and I've done it where I've, like, 
really not prepared and it's kind of like it's all kind of come out evenly like it's weird i've done so many of them now i think i've done like 12 or something like that so it's kind of like at this point it's it's almost like what do you uh you know you you want to like be better and you want to do better and you know so it's it's about like the continual like how do i approach this and make it new and different well with i mean comedy sometimes the best stuff is obviously the most honest and sort mm-hmm. of the most brutally honest yeah and you 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 live in that category yeah is there ever been stuff where you go I can't I'm not putting that in the set I don't know I think that uh, you know sometimes you go well I I wonder if this is gonna be a problem and I wonder if this is like going to be hurtful and then I wonder like does it matter and then also is it more important to service the honesty of it than to um, I, I don't I'm not really sure like I, I think I always like change my mind about it and then also the times change too yeah. and like what we can sort of think about uh, it's weird like how much people are now retracting a lot of things that they said in 2011 and 2012 which wasn't that long ago it wasn't that long ago <laughs> but so on social mo- on social media but it was a weird thing where there was a lot of people like or like telling jokes in that space that they were like I, I, I'm, I, I can't I'm so sorry I said that and I, I'm like well I'm sure that that's happened for me a million times but I can't I don't know like I'm not sure like you 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 kind of go well I, I want to just tell as many jokes as possible but you know you never know like what's gonna be a problem or not well it's 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 interesting to me because it seems like it's living in this space where you know, like you just mentioned, it's like, oh, some, maybe something you said on Twitter in 2012, mm-hmm. now people are angry about it. I always wonder when people take those down, are they like, are they, do they have, do they have true contrition for what they said? Or are they mm. sort of just like, I got caught and I need to sort of just like. I think it's more like, um, I have been, uh, like, I, I, I can't, um, really uphold the values that I have now because values change so sure. much and language changes so much and like what you can say kind of just gets policed in a different way all the time and uh, so it's a I think it's actually a better time now than more than ever in terms of the way that we can like approach language and look for equality but for comedy it gets very tricky like now you know we went through this weird little phase where everybody was post racism and post sexism <laughs> like for like very it was very short, um, which I think is good because I don't think we're post any of that. But there, there's um, more of this culture of outrage now that uh, uh, leads to more apologies. Sure. Well, and then that's, I mean, this is interesting because comedy, stand-up comedy in particular, is more popular than ever, it feels like. Mm-hmm. It, like it's just like it's making headlines constantly. Yeah. For negative reasons, yeah. for positive reasons, yeah. and I did want to ask just about, I guess that in general, and, and I kind of want to ask about Louis C.K. just because he made national headlines for getting on stage in New York City, so that yeah. becomes a major news cycle right. story. I'm interested in your thoughts on somebody like him, his path, I guess, back, and even if he deserves one. Like, I, no one knows. I mean, um, well, I think for somebody who was such a genius at finding his audience in the most uh, insightful way, in you know, sourcing those people who were going to pay five dollars to watch a special all the way down to um, getting this like very 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 specific very diehard loyal crowd to you know watch his shows that he would create and write and oh, edit his and all DIY that. paradigm yeah, everything how, yeah. that he searched high and low to find his audience in such a brilliant way yet did not find his audience for jerking off <laughs> he just found the worst people like why would you want to do that in front of people who don't want to see it and everything else you've done is made specifically for people who want to see it that to me is like the most it's the most lazy <laughs> crazy odd thing like why would you i i mean people are like totally missing the point of like how how genius he was at finding his audience yet for the one thing they didn't was just somehow it it, it and, and maybe it comes down to uh misogyny sure. that 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 women don't count in that audience you know that that's that's the the thing that nobody seems to hit upon but i think that's true you know i think it's but yeah somebody that that really kind of had a knack for Knowing what people wanted, really, 
fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> it's very weird. It is. Well, I mean, I guess, and that's the question. I mean, I don't even know if it, it is a question. Nobody even really knows how to talk about it. But like, how does somebody come back or do they not come back? Like, I, I don't know. know. I guess it's, I guess market dictates or people can decide or I don't know. it's about I'm, who gives the platform. I, I mean, maybe, um, that maybe that's sort of a, it's like a John, John Gomeshi kind of thing. Like, do you, do you get Moxie Fruvius back together? <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, yeah, exactly yeah. Something, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's, a, it, it, that whole thing, like, is so weird that he would go back to doing, um, like, podcasts. Like, you know, know, that, that, that kind of thing is, um, it, but it's the same kind of thing. Like, how do you, uh, um, how, how do you come back? I don't know. I don't know why you'd want to. That's, I, I, yeah. I mean, that's why it's a, I guess, like, it's a question, but not. I mean, I'm not, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, um, I have, my friend, uh, Melinda Hill had a funny thing about it. She said, uh, me too soon. <laughs> Which I thought was so concise and a perfect joke about it. But it's something that it's like, I, 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 the, that sort of like the planning on like returning it, it is that kind of thing of like the entitlement of um, somebody like Bill Cosby who yeah. does shows and sort of thinks like, well, why can't I? And I, I mean, it's, it's very, um, it, it's that mindset of like, of course people are going to come see my movies like Woody Allen, of course, you know like Roman Polanski is like, of course, you know, of course I'm going to be honored in France. Like that's totally. Like and because for so long it was going that way, yeah. but it's like, it's, that's changed. It's changed. Yeah. I think forever. You yeah. know, I don't think, I don't think going forward, it's like people would just be like, Oh, I like a Woody Allen movie. Or like you said, like Polanski's really talented. I just don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I think that is probably over going I, forward. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you're realizing now, um, how much people have, stood behind um or hidden behind the moniker of genius sure you know and gotten away with so much because of that and it's just it's the fact that that's not acceptable anymore is a great thing i think that's really it's progress it's progress in the canadian way it's progress yeah progress (laughs) in uh in comedy as well there's sort of this i don't even know if it's like a raging debate or just again like a headline or a a clickbait but people talk a lot about sort of the difference between you know like hannah gadsby's special or like Mm -hmm. this really sort of introspective reflective comedy that maybe is more of like a one person show and then certain comedians are going well shit that's not stand up you know what i mean these sort of like revelatory sets where do you fall on that spectrum? Because, I, I, I mean, should there be a label with comedy or is it just like a no, show is a show? A show? It's a great art form and it can be anything. And I I love Hannah. I think she's incredible. And um, this is this is the hard thing is Hannah and I were supposed to have dinner two years ago at this restaurant in Sydney, Australia. And <laughs> she said she was going to meet me at five o'clock. And she and I was I was sitting there with friends. We're waiting, and she didn't come, and she didn't answer her phone. And we haven't talked since then. So I have more issues about the fact that we are. I'm as far as she knows, I'm still sitting at that table. We haven't talked about it. You got beef with Anna. Well, I don't know if it's beef, but we were supposed to have like chicken okay. or <laughs> spring rolls, and uh, <laughs> we're more like shrimp. But she uh, and I, she, I could still be at that table. <laughs> She's a genius. Um, although bad at canceling, <laughs> can't all you plans. have to do is text. It's so and simple. say I can't come. But um, I love her, and I think everything that she does is amazing you know and and she's she's an old friend of mine regardless of dinner or whatever (laughs) but it's an incredible thing what she's been able to do and also causing those sorts of arguments in comedy that's what's so great about what she's doing is that like well this is not comedy well this is not comedy i love that i love when people are so different and and take such a stand that it's something that has to be debated and i think it's great yeah um, lastly, as we wrap up, because I feel like, and, and you know, even you just explaining uh, having a relationship with Hannah and sort of the community of comedians, is there anybody that you like have your eye on that you're like, these are some of the best comedians right now, and what makes them special? Um, I have a lot of, I mean, there's people who I just love, and uh, that 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 for me, I mean, 
you know, I love I love Tig Notaro. I I love Wanda She's Sykes, new Star of Trek. course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she's I, amazing. I just moderated a panel with that whole cast. Oh, wow. Yeah. But uh, yeah, she's in the trailer. I don't know what role she'll play going forward. She's incredible. I mean, she can do anything. Yeah. She's just, she's just so funny to watch just her, um, the way that she speaks. I, I find her, like, I'm, every time I see her, I'm really just, I cannot wait for the next word. Like, yeah. I just, I'm in such anticipation over everything that she says, and, and I am so excited about it. Um, so, the, I, I, I love, yeah, Wanda Sykes, I love Fortune uh, Fortune Feimster, um, Feimster, Fortune Feimster, um, she's incredible. Um, so, the, I, and Aquafina, who is, like, my baby, um, <laughs> she's amazing. She blew up. She, she she literally just hosted the award show here uh, in Canada, the yeah. MMVAs. Incredible. Yeah. And, and I mean, somebody who is so driven and, and so brilliant and, you know, um, just I've, I've been able to work with her and in the studio and, you know, see all of that and, and, and know her so well. And I just, I adore her. And Ken Jong too, who I know is here at the festival as well. He's yeah. a good friend of mine. who's just so amazing. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of great comedians that I just I get so excited to see and um, you know in, in, in Britain there's Paul Foote who uh, I think is is really incredible too so that there's a million people but I I'm a big fan of comedy which is it's fun to go see oh Nick Swartzen too he was I just, just here today yeah, yeah I love he's him. actually gonna be on the we have two components to our show one is like mm. an improv thing and so the other guy that I do the show with just did like a whole thing with him today oh yeah but he said it went well he's great yeah. he's my little baby well this actually I I ask a lot of comedians this because I'm always sort of like uh, really impressed by the uh, camaraderie in the community, mm -hmm. but also it's a competitive business. You know, there yeah. is something like like about entertainment and, you know, there's only so many jobs. Do you find that or do you find yourself sort of always just like, no, I'm happy for everybody and all that? Or are you kind of like a, hey. No, it is it is competitive and it isn't. There is there is something to that like. Actually, um, and the the fact is that when we're all out there, like there, you're only on your own. Like you're you're you. There is no real competition between you and other comics when you're just out there. It's 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 a it's a weird thing. I mean, and there's always enough work. It's, it's always enough place for people to make people laugh. There's always going to be that. I think um, there's different ways that you can go about it and. I don't know, like, I think, um, I don't know, like, I feel like there's room for artists. I think there's um, people I really appreciate, people I would love to see more of, and so I'm, I'm always very supportive of everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Much appreciated. Welcome to the dessert. Of course, our guest and great friend, Matthew Unsworth. Is it Matthew on your birth certificate or is it Matt? It's Matthew, yeah. Yeah, Matthew uh, Unsworth has stuck around for the dessert. Thanks for staying, buddy. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's great. Uh, Shaney Boy, you're a pop culture aficionado. What's going on today? So our last one, a guy tried to audition to become a writer for the digital dessert team. Okay. And you actually are a big Hollywood writer. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a writer. Which we're going to talk about in the intro, which we haven't recorded. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I... I'm not sure if you've been following our social media, but I put it out there if anyone had a question for Mike, uh, Max, or myself, or a big Hollywood writer <laughs> so that people could call this in. This was in our Insta story. Mm. And some people actually had some questions for, for you. me. For you, a big Hollywood writer. Right. So hey, that's you exciting. You the word big a lot. A Hollywood, a Hollywood writer. writer. writer for eh, you packed on, on a few pounds. <laughs> you're on a network show. Yeah, okay. First guy is Zach Babbins. I like these call in shows. Yeah. Like and by call in, I mean we call them. Because I don't. <laughs> yeah. Shane, Shane doesn't give out his number. Although I guess they'll get it the minute this he is calls. Just yeah, it's, it's logistics. It has nothing to do with me being scared. <laughs> no one said you were scared, bro. <laughs> I'm not scared. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Good afternoon. This is Zach. Hi, Zach. This is the podcast. Hey, guys. How are you? Hey, Zach. What is your question? Uh, my question is, what's your favorite part of any of the live shows you've done? Okay, sorry. I thought you were going to have a question for the Hollywood writer at first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can do that next if you okay, want. Okay, you have another question. Okay, so we'll answer the, the favorite part of the live shows that we've done. Of the two live shows that we've done, my favorite part was when Shane and the Nut had a rap battle, and it ended with Shane doing a retaliatory slap. 
Yeah, that was a really good part. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought the rap battle was probably my favorite part of the live show. Mind you, no one actually got to hear that part because we, for legal reasons, we had to cut it out of the dessert. But if you were live in the room, it was pretty special. Yeah, were you at that uh, show by any the chance? The first one? No, I was at the other live show. Oh, oh you missed yeah, out, man. That one wasn't as good. <laughs> yeah, my favorite part of the live show was the first one. I didn't like the second one. My favorite part of the live show was the first one we did. Yeah. Okay, what's your question for our big Hollywood writer? Uh, what's the one question that no one's ever asked you that they wish they would? Oh, that's a cop out question. Oh man. Um, that's Next a, caller. That, that's a that's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. to ask. You're making him do the uh, question. Yeah, ask me how Next I'm doing. Next caller, Zach. You're a good guy. We got to go. I feel you know. We're sorry, Zach. <laughs> Disappointing. <laughs> Hang up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Producer Max, hang up. We're calling, uh, should we call the UK? Okay, let's call the UK. It's Elizabeth. She lives at Buckingham Palace. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. I heard you were here. Cannot be completed as died. Are you really going to try to call the UK? You couldn't figure that out. I mean, because I couldn't figure yeah, that out. Yeah, I think I've never been able to figure that there's out. There's certain numbers there's like, that you, you have, have to, to like dial the plus. There's, uh, oh, the you plus. have to hold down zero. Yeah. Okay, it's calling. Sorry. Okay. Well, we'll do it. Hello? Hello, N Nikolai. This is Shane from uh, Mike on Much. Hi, Shane. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Yeah, really good. Thank you. We're just wondering what your question was. Okay, so my question was, of all the past pods that you've done, which do you wish had been a TV show and why? Oh, all interesting. Let all, all of the podcasts that we've done? Yeah. Hmm. Which can you picture would have been good as a TV oh, show? That's a good question. That is a good question. That's a great question. What time is it right now? Are you in England right now? Ten something, right? Yeah, I'm in England right now. It's um, coming up to ten o'clock in the evening. Sorry to call you so late. It's only five o'clock here. We're about to actually go to the pub. But, yeah, uh, that's a British thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's no problem. I'm at home alone because my husband's at his Christmas party, so it's a bit of entertainment for me. Oh, good. Okay, I'm glad we could entertain you. I uh, I would say that probably the best oh wow when what would that be we, we've had quite a oh few my over God. The last time. this is the hard question for me because i have the worst memory i don't remember one thing we've talked about <laughs> in with the 120 episodes we've had for I'm me not... it would be the first time that i met uh vanessa from the bachelor oh that was a good one because that that night i could have a lot of uh pictures and texts that would really help visually and i got into a a fight with a comedian named Eddie Delisepi, <laughs> and there was like right. there was a, a a visual like exchange on text that I could show that was very embarrassing and hilarious. So that would be my pick. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've heard that one, but no. But this is part of the reason I'm asking. I'm going to go back through some of the old ones. Oh, okay. I like that. You're directing me to some great ones. Mike, what was your your interview? Um, oh, there's there's been a bunch. It's it's hard. It's hard to narrow them down again. Okay. Noel, Noel Gallagher for me. No, but Noel's in the show. I know, that's why. So that's but, why it's hard. Whalen. Scott Whalen, that was a short interview, was but, a, you know, he's no longer. What was, like, one of, yeah. the, like, like Nor some, I'm trying to think, like, the bigger names that you think would, like, look good on television. Like, the Kings of Leon one, I thought sure. was Sure, Nelly Furtado cool. was interesting. Yeah. Any uh, of your comedians actually, you guys interviewed, I, like, all of those were mm, pretty solid. Comedians are cool. Also, um, uh, I, oh, my goodness, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, the lead singer of Keen. T Tom Chaplin. Yeah. He was, uh, that was an interesting conversation. I really liked that. We got kind of deep. So that would have been a Chris Hadfield really would have been good too. Chris actually. Hadfield. Yeah. And like the Coachella episode because we were in Coachella. Yeah. So. That was fun. I think for me, um, I think it would have translated well was my story. I forget which episode number it is, but it's meeting Cheryl Crow and Sarah oh. McLaughlin. <laughs> uh, what episode? Did you listen to that one? It's. Uh, I forget what episode it is, but if you look at a Max meeting Cheryl Crow. Yeah, no, I've listened to the Sh yeah, Cheryl Crow one. It's okay, so, but I think that would have been funny to visualize. Like you, you could put some funny graphics in there. Yeah, that would have been a good fact. show. I think would have translated well for the open of the show. And do you have any questions for a Hollywood writer? And I don't know which Hollywood writer it is. Uh, he, he, he writes for a show called Happy Together. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the one with Jim Carrey in, right? Uh, that's with, uh, what's his name? Damon Wayans Jr. Damon Wayans Jr. It's on uh, uh, Channel like, 4. Yeah, yeah. yeah, do you get Channel 4 out there? <laughs> we get Channel 4 out here, yep. Yeah. It's probably on that one. I'll have to Based look it on, up. Uh, ben Winston. Yeah. Do you have, do you have okay, a question for um, him? I would say, um, I haven't actually prepared a question, but mm -hmm. one of the questions I was going to ask you guys as well, which you can put to the Hollywood writer, would be um, uh, looking to the future. And what would their what would their New Year's resolutions be? Is that time of year? That's not a real Hollywood. No. What would you say your resolution uh, writing? Like? New Year's resolution. Uh, just keep writing. 
<laughs> and uh, keep at it and write a bunch of more scripts and specs and whatnot. That's good. I'd like to lose a couple LBS, you know? I could lose a couple LBS, too. Yeah. So lose weight and keep Ron writing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you so much for uh, calling Happy in. holidays. No worries. Happy holidays to you all as well. You. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So we have two more. It's a real home run of a segment so far. <laughs> <laughs> you guys loved call-in shows before. <laughs> You were like, this is the greatest idea ever. <laughs> carry on, carry on. I cut on. out all the bullshit. Carry on, carry on, too, carry on. It's not like the Twitter segment, which is just trapped in time for the live audience. <laughs> uh, uh, that is great. <laughs> is this the Margaret Cho episode or the uh, Jason Mraz? I, I always ask Dan. Dan really is. He runs it. I can be Margaret Cho. Shane, I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> Do you want to be in the Margaret Cho or the Jason Mraz? Which one's better for your street cred? Yeah. Oh, who do you think we have more Cho, listeners? Right? Probably Cho. Yeah, you want to be on the Cho one. Okay. That's good. Hello? Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Is it working now? Yeah. Okay. I could hear you. Could you hear me? No, I couldn't. Now we can, though. Oh, terrific. That probably, you would have been better off that way. So, what is your question? Uh, my question is for everyone in the room. I'd like to know what the best movie you saw this year was. Oh, that's a great question. What was uh, it? Uh, best movie we saw this year. Oh. Uh, what's your name? Alicia. It's Alicia. We know Alicia. Alicia. What's up? Oh, yeah. Hi, hey, Alicia. Good to see you. White Earth Stars. To you. Yeah. Um, my the best movie I saw this year was A Quiet Place. That that movie uh, Ooh, blew me away. I, I had low expectations going in, and I walked out, and I just thought that for what it was in the genre and all that, it it uh, it was a masterpiece. Anzi, uh, it's a toss up. I would say. I mean, I gotta say that Lady Gaga in Stars Born is up there for yeah. sure. There you go. I think that's that a close second. Eighth grade. Oh, I, never I haven't seen Eighth Grade yet. Oh, it's on the list. Check it out. It's Heard so it's good. great. Well, Shane, remind me of what the other good movies were this year. I, I don't remember. I, I haven't seen any movies, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the pop culture aficionado <laughs> Not strikes <one>. again. Um, <laughs> I like, um, I think I liked A Beautiful Boy, which I don't think critics loved, but I thought it was awesome. Yeah, it was Steve Carell. And, uh, and you Tim liked it? it? Yeah, I thought it was awesome. I mean, it kind of wrecked me. I... Um, I usually don't like to watch like movies about drug addicts because they really throw me off for the next 72 hours. But uh, And that's exactly what happened to me when, after I watched this movie. But I thought the per- performances were really good. The movie was really touching, heartbreaking. Did you illegally download that? No, I watched it in theaters. I watched oh. it uh, in Asbury Park, New Jersey. On, I think uh, it's getting nominated. Yeah. Like, there's, yeah. What are the other big nominations this year? On that note, uh, Stars Born, Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, I like that actually. I know people. Don't There's like, like five boy movies, like yeah. Boy Erased, Beautiful Boy, Ben is Back. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't you see? Didn't you like First Performed? What? First Performed. Oh, first. Ethan Hawke. Oh, yeah, that was pretty cool. I wouldn't say that was my favorite movie, but that was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And I have not seen any. Are <laughs> <laughs> you have a kid? Yeah. It's a little time consuming. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for calling in. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Thank Happy you holidays. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm. And keep on watching that Crave show. I, I can't. She's oh. in the States. All right. But you have family in Canada. Get them like to. If would like to share uh, their subscription with me, I'd be super thankful. But yeah, I legitimately can't sign up for it because I don't have a Canadian credit card. Oh, shit. Okay. So, oops. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, one more, guys. Don't worry. Okay. Unzi's just started texting people. <laughs> that's that's oh. all right. <laughs> Do we have any good between calling banter? Um, no, I'm saving it for the open. We're getting another movie. I know. Gosh, there's I always know there's a, a movie out there. There was another one that was kind of in this in the a quiet place realm for me that I saw. I thought was great. I had issues with Quiet Place. Really? Just live by the waterfall, man. I know. That's what I thought. That, that's fine. That really. That's like. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's oh, done. You know, Why are you living in the middle of the quietest place in the world, <laughs> in the middle of the countryside? It makes no sense. <laughs> the scenery, bro. Yeah, no, yeah, like, live by like, the water. So she loves the view, you yeah. know. She really, it's like she's blaming it on the wife. You're like, you know, I wanted to live by the waterfall, but you know how, you know, happy it's wife, happy down life. There. <laughs> I'm practical. She's got her wants. You know, uh, she, she, she grew up in the country. She's got to be in the country. <laughs> she grew up on a farm. 
<laughs> Hello. Hello, is this Christine Becker? Hi. Hi, this is the Mike on Much podcast. Are you from Winnipeg, Christine? How are you guys doing? Good, how are you? Good. Are you from Winnipeg? Yeah. Yeah, right. we've met. Yeah. Were you guessing area codes? Uh, Max is, yeah. It's no, I didn't hobby. even see the area code, but I remember you, Christine. We, we oh. met in Thunder Bay, didn't oh. we, as well? Yeah, as well as the live pod? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. And what is your question today? Well, um, one of my favorite things about the pod is you're just like off the cuff conversations that you guys do where you're just talking amongst your friends and you're not really concerned about censoring yourself. So, mm-hmm. TV obviously has different requirements. So I'm wondering, how did you guys find having to, like, be on topic and censor yourself? And did you feel like your conversations were restricted? And was it weird for you? Well, I'll, I'll start with this answer, uh, Christine. So the pod is actually he- heavily censored. I think if this, was a, <laughs> if this was a live radio show, we'd be fired probably after, like, the second episode. Because <laughs> like, if it was live, one of us would put our foot in our mouth or say something we didn't quite mean or not be as uh, articulate. Even in the last episode we, re- we recorded, I said something that if it had been live, I probably mm-hmm. would have been fired immediately. And so it's uh, the same thing with the TV show. We, we, we like the, the comfort of knowing that if there's something that doesn't land, that we can we can cut it out. Yeah, but but I do think that um, whereas like we come in here pretty loose and sort of uh, kind of make it up as we go once we start, when you have a whole TV crew and sort of everybody on set, we tried to be a little bit more... Um, I guess focused on what the topic was we were going to talk about without sort of strangling out the spontaneity. Yeah, and in some cases it's weird. I'm not sure if you've watched the show at all yet, but um, actually I haven't. I have a date with my Crave membership tonight. Yeah, oh, nice. well done. Let well, us know what you like about it. Uh, oh, for sure. Does she have a question for Enzi? Well, I was going to answer. Oh, sorry, sorry. Shaney. Yeah, my yeah, bad. Yeah. I was just going to. I was just <laughs> going to say that um, <laughs> on the pod we would probably end up beeping the c word. <laughs> <laughs> but on the sh- I listened to that episode yesterday. Yeah, see, so notice how we beep the c word. On the actual show, you're going to hear the c word three times. Okay. So it's less sense from you. Uh, I say it twice, and then a Mr. T impersonator says it once. Christine, you seem like an—I don't know you very well. You seem like a, an enlightened person. Um, okay. what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Just uh, as a brief poll on the c word. On the c word. Okay. On a dude saying the c word. Um, it's not the most comfortable word mm-hmm. to hear come out of a man's mouth, right. but um, honestly, if it's in the right context, I kind of just chill out a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, context is important. Kind of out in the world, and I guess if you were being, if it was really derogatory, obviously we can tell with tone and context of what's going on, but. I think, like, if we're just intelligent and we're not emotional about it, we can just sort of chill at times. So you only use it for a comedic bit, and, you know, we lean on your comedic sense. Yeah, it was to be shocking, and to be honest, I had intended to beep it. Huh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we'll, 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 okay, we'll stop putting you in this weird uh, position of. Uh, okay, but Christine, thank you very much. Your feedback's for, been awesome. This yeah. has been great. Yeah. All right. I feel like there's just as much bad, many other bad words that could be beeped or yeah, it's true. Than it's that true. One. In Britain, they love the c word though. Australia too. They Australia, the they do. Yeah. Yeah, and they like say fag and like other different words. For too, c- it's for it's cigarette. Totally hey, Christine, yeah. keep it clean, okay? Yeah. Come on, <laughs> we'll come on Christine. Christine. All right, we yeah. gotta go. We gotta think about <laughs> That's this. That's not cool, Christine. Okay, producer Max. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Christine. You're the best. Bye. Thanks. Bye. That's it. That's all. That's our episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to Margaret Cho. Thank you to everyone who called in, including all the way from England. Thank you to Matthew Unsworth. Hey, hey, hey. Thanks for having me. Check out Heist Podcast. I should have done that in the, in the uh, opening. Yeah, we didn't, we'll do it good. in the Webby D. We'll write about it. Heist Podcast, uh, which is great. Max and I have both been on it. Shane, you got to bring it Shane's on. on the latest episode. Oh, there you yeah. go. Yeah. You, you got to get him on. But we got to get you on as a real guest. A we guest. try to do that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Michael Much Podcast. We got to thank anybody else, Maxi Boy, before I sh- shut it down. You can be found on the Instagram. Oh yeah, clownsalad.com. Clown is it dash salad? Or no, just, just straight salad. up. Yeah. And uh, we can find us on the internet on Instagram and Twitter. Mike on Much. Subscribe. Uh, you know, shoot us a comment. Uh, give us a like. Do all that good stuff. Everywhere you find your podcast. And now a TV show on Crave. The Michael Much Podcast, produced by Max Kerman. I'm your host, Mike Derman. See you next week. We don't die on the weekend.